So it made me want to do this one that, like I did in the style of Emily Dickinson called, there it is, that's that. I've been in the woods at night with a bottle of Jack and a beautiful girl. I know what it's like to be on top of the world. Been there a few times, that's why I stay. I know it will be mine again someday. <laughs> one poem, one story, because I like never tell those, I'm excited to tell a story, but it's a secret. And maybe a song if I have like two more minutes. Yeah, yeah. And um, Tom was all like, whiskey, weed, wine. I love the W's, words. And then here's one I don't love, wrong. But I kind of do, and this is why this is wrong. Eventually, you find out you were wrong about everything. Nothing stays right. You're finally sure, and then all at once, it switches all around. The world is flat, then round. Women shouldn't work, too. Lady, get a job. Square meals become the food pyramid, but now you're supposed to eat the rainbow. Doctors recommended camel cigarettes. Chocolate, your vice, is good for you. A kiss turns out to be the middle finger. An insult reveals itself to be a charm. Just wait long enough. You'll find the favorite scarf you thought you lost forever. The hero becomes the villain. Your poem becomes your novel. Your novel becomes a postcard. Your mother becomes your child. We become and keep becoming because we're wrong. <laughs> so remember, seriously, this is a secret. In New York's Hudson Valley, most everyone in my family worked for the phone company in the 1970s and 1980s. My dad, Gary, dealt cocaine in addition to his day job operating a forklift at the Bell Atlantic Warehouse. Ma Bell, as the family referred to it. We all had t-shirts with the Bell logo and the reach out and touch someone right across the chest. There were two phones in almost every room of my house. Our house belonged to my paternal grandfather. That's where my dad did and sold his blow. The basement of our home was also where his rock band practiced. His porn collection was piled throughout the house. I used these to gain friendship at school, offering magazines and beaten up drumsticks to rambunctious cute boys who would give me their attention tying me to trees in the woods, or rolling around with me in the dank hidden spaces under porches and behind sheds. I liked getting my heart rate up, running, being scared or joyous, flirtatious. My house had a name, the Sugar Shack, and everyone knew it. All night long, people were in and out of our house. It was a constant party. My dad always had a rock band. He played guitar and sang, and though he had a horrible memory for words, he was a talented musician and very handsome. In the 70s, his straight blonde hair was long to his waist, and he wore velvet tunics with embroidery on them, made in India. In the 80s, he got a perm and wore his hair short on the top and to his shoulders in the back, a classic mullet. He wore fashion jumpsuits. He had one in every color and wore them zipped down to his belly button, showing off his zitty hairless chest. <laughs> My parents didn't have to forbid children coming over. The community naturally understood, except for the foreign scientists' kids whose parents didn't know because they were temporary workers at the university lab and because they were foreign. Most kids were warned that they were to never go to my house. It had a reputation that separated me from other children. Very few came to play. If they weren't foreign scientists' kids, it was because their parents used cocaine too. All the grown-ups would disappear for hours into the basement. Any kid that did come over, I felt compelled to show the secrets of the house to, trying to lift the weight of these secrets, showing them off like a mysterious world I could give away. My dad was a skilled carpenter and made furniture with bolted stash cabinets that hid drugs and had pop-out mirrors. He had built a plywood cabinet encased in steel, a safe. On top of it was an altar, a mirror always either clear or covered with a bandana a do-rag, as my dad would say. 
under which cocaine lay chopped up alongside various paraphernalia, razors and rolled up dollar bills. The walls of the basement were lined with huge porn posters for decoration and egg cartons for soundproofing because his band practiced there. I topped off every play date with a roll of Smarties, explaining it was speed for kids. I'd also make out with almost every kid, sweaty tussles with lots of kissing. I tried to teach my friends how to masturbate. I called it Healy. I wiggled around in a certain way, fully clothed, and didn't need to use my hands. I didn't know what I was doing, but it felt so good. I just wanted to share it. Pretty much every kid that did visit only visited once. <laughs> I think back to being an extremely sexual child. Where did that come from? Must be there were circumstantial reasons for us to be who we are. Do there have to be reasons? Or are we much more hardwired than we ever imagined? Existence is luck. I have memories of being around two years old and standing on the big brown and beige Charles Chips pretzel can as if it were my little runway pedestal, listening to the song Sexy Sharon while making sultry eyes. I pulled down my sleeve to reveal my bare shoulder and then licked it, slowly, seeking encouragement. My brothers and I used to look through the hundreds of pornographic magazines, no exaggeration, my dad left all over the house. We wondered why girls threw up white throw up onto men's penises. We all corroborated a socially acceptable version of normalcy for the public and for our pious Catholic grandparents. But my teenage aunts and uncles and my own parents, only 19 when I was born, partied hard, 80s style, at my house every night. I was expected to just lie my entire childhood about what my real life at home was like, opening beers for my dad's friends, chatting them up, and then shutting up. I talked about marijuana, cocaine, hallucinogens, fidelity, and pornography to my peers who talked about Little House on the Prairie, Dukes of Hazzard, Dallas, split-level ranches, swatches, jams, and Benetton. There was hardly anyone I could relate to, but when some kid experienced some sort of extreme situation, they sought me out to be their buddy for a couple months while they processed their own or their parents' alcoholism, eating disorder, affair, sexuality, or gender confusion. The drug-using kid who had to take a drug test called me. The kid who wanted to know how to smoke a joint or perform oral sex called me. A kid like me is in every school. We should have been rich considering how much money went through my house, but it all went up my dad's nose, an enormous habit. So we lived in dire conditions. My dad controlled the money and my mother barely got enough of it to pay for groceries. My brothers and I wore hand-me-downs from the 1960s that had belonged to our aunts and uncles. I watched our house deteriorate through the years. It had been a sweet 20s cottage when I was a small child, but by the time I was a teen, it was so run down, the plaster was falling from the lathe of the ceiling and the holes were worn into the kitchen floor so you could see the basement. While my dad did not have a good relationship with his own father, we never feared eviction from my grandfather. We paid a minuscule rent that barely covered the taxes, and once my mother left when I was 15, my dad stopped paying rent altogether. He plummeted it into a serious hell of crazy drug abuse, never able to hit bottom though because my grandpa just couldn't kick him out. Where did I come from? My mother, beautiful black-haired Roman Catholic, Irish-Italian American teenager who got pregnant and was forced into marriage by her Catholic family. My Italian grandfather would not let my mother bring a bastard into the world, so she married her high school sweetheart. One night after my parents had separated, I was staying with my dad as usual on a Wednesday night, and in a fit of rage and cocaine hyperactivity, Gary claimed that I was the reason he had never accomplished his dreams and that I wasn't even his daughter. I thought he was just being a jerk. Telling my mother this story upon returning to her house the next day, I expected her to shrug it off like any one of the other ridiculous impossible things my dad had said in his fits of insanity during our weekly visits. My mother denied his claim, but I couldn't deny a wash of the scariest, saddest tears I had ever seen, revealing something held back. She let out a desperate moaning cry, how could he? Over the following months, I gently interviewed aunts and uncles, piecing together discrepancies and the distinct possibility that I had questionable paternity. <laughs> We're all made of some secrets. 
ones we keep and ones we don't even know we have. It wasn't until I was in my 20s and about to be a mother myself that I finally confronted my mother about the true origin of my birth. In the slow build of impending motherhood, I was ambitiously curious to finally know the truth. My mother admitted to a potential other father, half Swedish, half mystery, named John. She had a possible address. She promised she'd seek the truth. A year later, I got a simple cheek swab paternity test in the mail. Mother, child, and potential father cheek cells are all that is needed to ter determine pr paternity now, when back in the 1970s it was impossible to know. My mother and I had decided to do the test without including Gary, the father I grew up with, as not to incite his anger or discomfort because he was in a dangerous, volatile state at this time in our lives, and his cells weren't necessary to determine if John was my father or not. My mother, the mystery father, and I all simply swabbed inside our cheeks with Q-tips and sent them to the same lab and waited for the results. The results were mailed to my mother, who had arranged the whole thing, so I wouldn't have to interact with the potential father until I had more information. We had decided we'd cross that bridge when we got to it. I pestered my mother for weeks following the test, wondering if it had come back. I can imagine many reasons why my mother would try to keep me from seeing the results, though she never admitted to one. Once an unusually long time had passed, I threatened to do another paternity test, but this time with Gary, and my mother wouldn't even be involved. I could get one of my brothers to cooperate in her stead. Finally, after this threat, my mother brought the test results to me, which revealed that my father was indeed John, not Gary, the man I had grown up with. I am not unique. You think you know who you are? You're probably wrong. <laughs> um, two minutes. At the shoe repair, the man fixes shoes. A woman walks in and says, I got the blues. Can you fix my soul? My soul. The man said no, but he took her home. His apartment was small, but it's better than alone. They stayed up all night, playing each other's bones, 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 bones. Morning came, man said, time to go. Woman said, wait. I want you to know the wind blows through my chest like I haven't any skin. And the worst part is I'm missing my heart. I forget who I left it in. The man replied, didn't you know we're only skeletons? We're only skeletons. Did you think that it would be different? I'm sorry. At the shoe repair, the man fixes shoes. A boy walks in and says, I got bad news. I think my tongue is broke. Every time I speak, I choke. I can't say what I mean. And when I try, I start to scream. Then a man came in to complain. His stitching was loose and his eye holes were lame. And a line formed around the block. People trying to get into the shoe repair shop. The shoe repair man said, I haven't any tools to fix your broken walks. Walking pails and pails of leather and nails aren't enough to cure all your ails. Didn't you know we're only skeletons? We're only skeletons. Did you think that it would be different? I'm sorry. Yeah. Whoa.